welcome to an unusual edition of Cracking the Cryptic, in which I'm going to revisit the puzzle that I did yesterday, which was this fascinating broken thermometer Sudoku by Kurt Hugo Schneider. Now, if you um, if you aren't familiar with that video, it's best to go and look at it, because I'm going to assume that you know the rules in talking about the puzzle now. And I'm going to talk about my approach to solving it and address a couple of the comments that I got uh, in the relation to the video that said that I, uh, I'd i bifurcated the puzzle and given that I tend to abhor bifurcation, I'd sort of not been true to my principles. Um, now I want to talk about that, but I also want to talk about Kurt's uh, own solving path for the puzzle, which was very different to mine. and. Is, it's fascinating. Uh, he put it in a comment on that video and I want to just briefly talk you through it and you know look at the way he thinks because it's very unusual and at least in my experience he has a very visual way of looking at uh, a Sudoku puzzle um, whereas I tend to be much more sort of micro based looking at the individual numbers themselves. Kurt sees the patterns and I wonder why that this is uh, why he's so good at uh, chess actually because he clearly has a very unusual uh, visual way of thinking and it was fascinating to me and given I'm obsessed with puzzles I thought you guys if you're watching this channel might also be interested to learn from it so firstly though I want to talk about um, why I don't think what I did down in this corner to start the puzzle yesterday was classic bifurcation. Bifurcation is a method where you guess a number, you follow it through, you reach contradiction, you go back to the start of the chain and you put the other digit in, if you like, and then you start the whole process again. Now, the difference between what I did and that is that I noticed something very odd about a broken thermometer puzzle and perhaps the best way of illustrating it is to look at a simpler broken thermometer puzzle. So here's one I made earlier. Um, this is a 6 by 6 Sudoku so we only have to enter in the numbers 1 to 6. I'm going to tell you the rules now. Um, there are two broken thermometers and two real thermometers. Now some of you will instantly laugh when you look at this because you will realize something about it. Some of you may need to play around with this to realize something about it. But the point that I wanted to, or that I spotted quite early in yesterday's solve, was that this puzzle here, which has an equal number of broken and real thermometers, is actually a broken Sudoku puzzle because it has two solutions. Um, let me show you those. Here we go. So I solved this earlier, but I'm not going to solve. It's a trivial puzzle, by the way. It won't take you long to solve. I will put the link in the video. But you can see here that these are the two solutions. So the long thermometers can take the numbers 1 to 6 in either order. And there's no way of disambiguating between which of these Sudokus is the correct, correct solution. They're, they're both equally correct. And you can also see, if you study it just for a moment, that all of the digits swi switch in these two solutions to their alternative partner. So the twos always switch to fives, the ones always to sixes, the threes to fours, and vice versa. Now this was important to how I approached Kurt's puzzle, because once I realized this, I realized that if I started on a logical chain, if I started with bifurcation, to use that naughty word, I wouldn't just be going along a logical path that if it broke meant I had to go back to the very start of the path and start again using the alternative number. I knew that every single number that I, I deduced in the incorrect chain would actually give me, I'd be able to enter in that cell again just using 10 minus that digit which actually is what happened in the video I got I got to a point up here I realized I'd gone down the wrong chain but rather than having to go back to the beginning of the chain and start again putting in I think it was a one in this square that 
that was was the correct number I should have put in I was able to fill in like most of the grid because of this feature of broken thermometer puzzles which is that they they exhibit a sort of isomorphism that occurs we've we've looked at this before in a couple of uh, situations with things like girth symmetrical placement and uh, other such uh, exotica um, but it, it was a really interesting moment for me in terms of the solve to come up with the idea that I could I could bifurcate in a way but in a way that felt to me like I was going to perform all the logic that was intended just perhaps with the wrong digits and that's exactly what happened so anyway that's that's my uh, that's my excuse but what I'm going to do now is I'm going to talk you through Kurt's solution now what he what he did is he starts from a blank grid like this one and he looked at this thermometer and he can immediately deduce obviously that this thermometer has a different parity to this thermometer that's pretty obvious because if we you know if we start with a low number here we're going to end up with a high number in this box here and therefore this thermometer must be different because it's these thermometers are so long so we can start by labeling uh, these in different colors let's use blue oh no i'm going to use red for that one and i'm going to use blue for this one and next what kurt does is he looks at this thermometer and he instantly deduces that this thermometer and this thermometer have different parity and the way that he does that is he notices that this is an eight cell thermometer and he thinks of eight cell thermometers as nine digits a string of nine digits with one missed out so he knows that if this thermometer and this thermometer have the same parity there's a massive problem in row eight of the grid because even though he can miss one digit out from this string he can't he, can, he could only miss one digit out from this string and there's going to definitely be a clash when these two thermometers overlap. So this one must be different to this one and must be red. Now once he gets this one is red, he, he still don't know whether it's a, a broken or a normal thermometer. The, the whole of Kurt's logic through the puzzle is to just figure out the parity of all this or of all the thermometer thermometers so this one now you can see that this one must have a different parity to this one because otherwise these three squares here if, if these were all the same side of the five as he puts it um, then we'd have five cells here that would have to be the same side of the five and there's only one two and three and four on one side of the five and six seven eight and nine on the other side of the five i.e four digits um, so this one must also therefore be blue now the next step is trickier but but also quite fascinating to me Kurt considers this square now because it's part of an eight cell thermometer we know this could have an extreme value like a one or a nine or it could have a nearly extreme value like a two or an eight but it must be one of those two things and Kurt thinks about that in the context of row seven believe it or not so he thinks let, let's think about where the extreme value the very extreme value associated with this thermometer might go in row seven so if you want to think about that concretely let's imagine that this was a one and ask where the one can go along row seven now because it's an extreme value it can never be partially along a thermometer so we can instantly rule out all of those squares now we can also rule out this one because the extreme value of this thermometer whatever we place in this square is either going to be low or very high but it's going to be the opposite to that number which is also going to so if this was a very low number we know this would be a very high number so in fact we know the extreme value associated with this thermometer 
must go in that square there. I'll label that purple. What about the next most extreme value associated with this thermometer? So whether if this is a starting with a low number, that's going to be the 2, or if it's starting with a high number, that's going to be the 8. Where do the 2 or the 8 go in this row? And again, Kurt does this without particularly thinking about the numbers 2 and 8. He's just looking at it by reference to the length of the thermometer. So he says this square instantly can't take a 2 or an 8. It can't take a nearly extreme value because it's in the middle of a thermometer. And it's in the middle of a long thermometer. So that he knows that the nearly extreme values would have to go in those squares, if at all. So it's definitely not here. Let's look at this thermometer. Can the nearly extreme value go in the center of it? Well, clearly no, because it, it must be in one of these squares if it's there at all. So it's not here, it's not here. It can't be in either of these two squares for the same reason that, you know, if this was a one, this couldn't be a one. These have different polarity. So if this is low numbers, these are gonna be very high numbers. So it's not going in either of those squares. This square is not extreme enough within its thermometer to be a nearly extreme value, and neither is this one, um, because obviously this is these thermometers go the same way. So if this is a 1, 2, for example, this is an increasing thermometer. This is going into high numbers when it needs to be going into low numbers. So the only two possibilities we're left with for where the nearly extreme value can go in row 7 would be those two squares. Now, this one is impossible because I'm just going to close my door, actually. Sorry about that. There's about to be a kid's party here. Um, so if this was the nearly extreme value, then we would know that this would have to be the extreme value. So to put that in numbers, for those of you who prefer numbers to the visuals, you know, if if this was a low starting thermometer then and we and this was the nearly extreme version of a low starting thermometer it would be a 2 therefore the 1 would have to go here and that would give us a problem here there would be nothing we could put in this square so we would know we know for sure that the only square the nearly extreme value can go into in row 7 is that one. Uh, let's make that purple as well. So now let's have a look at this thermometer and ask the question. The nearly extreme value associated with this thermometer we know for sure it goes at this side of this thermometer. So this thermometer cannot have the same parity as this one. Isn't that clever? It's really clever that, I like that. Um, okay, so the, the highlighting is working, right? So that's good. So we get this one. Now the next one that Kurt looks at is this one. Now this is this is even more complicated to see visually, but, but, but beautiful. So let's look at it. Now, what Kurt notices, or designed, I mean, it's his puzzle, um, is that if this is a broken, or if this has the opposite parity to this thermometer, what would be the effect of that? Now, the effect of that is that this becomes an eight cell thermometer. So let's put some numbers in it so you can see. Let's imagine this was a one, two, three. So this is a broken thermometer. The three here would then have to be a real thermometer so you can see how the the numbers are increasing in a strict order and just if we went nine eight seven we'd just get them decreasing so this would become a sequence of eight digits somehow now Kurt then looks at row six and this this to me is fascinating it's a very very unusual way of thinking about thermo sudoku in my opinion he looks at this square and this square now see if you can see something interesting about those two squares. It's not easy to see. But because these thermometers here, these two thermometers have different parity, these two squares in effect form a pair. 
because they are the same number of digits away from their respective poles if you like so let's again let's imagine this was a low digit th thermometer this square here would be one two three four five squares away from a high number okay so let's remember that that's five squares away from a high number now we hypothesize this was a low starting thermometer now this has a different parity so this would be a high starting thermometer let's count five squares from a high starting one two three four five so these two squares are the same number of cells away from the sort of uh, their corresponding poles which means that they must form a pair so because these are both eight cell thermometers we know that well we can actually do this let's actually do it and just to show you it might be easy to see so that if this starts low this would be a four or a five What have I done wrong there? Oh, I see what I've done. I started with the wrong polarity. See me. There we go. So this forms a four five pair. Now, obviously, if we started high here, we'd actually end up with presumably five six here and five six here with this starting low. But this is absolutely crucial because now you can see that these four digits here, let's remove the five from there these four digits here have to be extreme values they are the most extreme values associated with whatever we put into this square so if this square if this square is a low number these will be the numbers one two three and four if this square is a high number these will be the numbers nine eight seven six now why does that matter well that matters because kurt uses his his trick here of seeing this thermometer as a nine, a sequence of nine digits with one missed out to immediately say well if that's true if this is a sequence of nine digits with one missed out and then what we would have here in this situation is we could have uh, let's put some real digits in to show you We would know that this was 987 like this and you can see it breaks it breaks because this pair forces the extreme values here and once that's the case we cannot miss two digits out from this consecutive sequence if this is an eight cell thermometer it's difficult stuff isn't it it's difficult but it's absolutely fascinating and remember Kurt, I genuinely think the way he does this is visually. He's not putting in numbers the way I am um, in order to come up with this logic. Um, so that all proves that this is not an eight cell thermometer. So that must also be red. And we're nearly there now in terms of finishing off the logic because now we've got four thermometers here that are all colored red. So if these are the broken thermometers, we know every single other thermometer in the puzzle must be a real thermometer. That would mean, in particular, all of those thermometers would have to be real. And that creates another of these eight cell therm thermometers. And again, this is lovely. This creates a problem because of this cell. This little cell we worked out was the corresponding cell to the extreme value of this thermometer. So if this was a one or a two, or if it, well, if this is a low number, we knew that this would have to be the one. Now that means this square could not be the extreme value associated with this thermometer. This would have to be a two. This is an eight cell thermometer. And that would put a three and a four into those squares. And now this thermometer is broken because we can't miss out two numbers from an eight cell thermometer. You can try and hide one of the three and the four over here, but you can't hide both of them. One of them will clash in these four squares. And that is enough for us to deduce with certainty that these red squares therefore are the real thermometers, 
we need one of these to be another real th thermometer and therefore we need two more broken thermometers that's going to be a broken thermometer um, and we can disambiguate uh, this these this pair in the way that I showed in the earlier video so I wanted to go through that because I think I found it fascinating I know some of you will find it fascinating too and what a privilege it is to to look into the mind of a guy who is uh, you know is clearly something of a genius um, so come back soon for another edition of Cracking the Cryptic. Mark's recording a simpler video, t video today on a classic Sudoku. So you might want to look out for that if you're feeling that your brain's been fried. See you soon.